Mr. Fietam, you've said in your statement today that removing the concrete blocks is not on the GSD's agenda. Can you explain in what circumstances you might consider removing them? Well, I can't envisage a set of circumstances at the present moment where we would be removing the, the reef. And indeed, I have actually said that the government had every single right to lay the reef. We wouldn't have done so, but the government had every right to lay the reef because those are British Gibraltar territorial waters. And we can do in British Gibraltar territorial waters what we like, despite the fact that we wouldn't have done it. What I am saying, and what, I, what distinguishes myself from Mr. Picardo is that whilst he says, and I think it's a populist, a populist statement that really serves absolutely no purpose, hell would freeze over before I remove the blocks, I say no, I will always act in accordance with the best interests of Gibraltar, which, what, with, in accordance with what benefits this community, and although I can't see a set of circumstances at present and it's not on the agenda, I don't know what the, what the future holds. That's my position. You suggested in a, in a radio program earlier this week that, for example, if there were a, a wider agreement that would benefit Gibraltar, for instance, if Spain were to agree uh, to not have any more incursions into Gibraltar waters in that scenario, then you might be prepared uh, to look at it. But isn't it naive? Well, that's not what I've actually said. No, that's not what, I, what I've actually said. Look, I've, I've made a number of, uh, I've actually tackled this issue on a number of occasions. And what I actually said the first time that you asked me this particular uh, question, which was last year, was that if you had an overall agreement that basically uh, resolved and settled and secured the British sovereignty jurisdiction and control over our waters, well, it would be absolute madness if the impediment was the blocks. That's what, that, that, is the, that is the position. Now, that is highly, highly unlikely because, of course, we have a situation where the Spanish government is highly, unli it's highly unlikely that they will do precisely that. But what, I, but what you cannot do in politics, what you cannot do, and what I object to, is the closing of doors on something that is not fundamental to British sovereignty, control, and jurisdiction of our waters or anything else. That's the point. But isn't it rather naive to expect Spain to abide by any agreement? If, for example, Mariano Rajoy or the Spanish foreign minister were to come to you and say, if you remove the blocks, we'll stop our incursions into Gibraltar waters, what would stop them reverting to that policy after you'd remove the blocks? I mean, we've seen already how they've reneged on Cordova, even though that is an agreement between uh, all the nations, the three parties involved to that, in that agreement. What makes you think it would be any different if you were to enter into an agreement now with the Pepe government? Yes, but Stephen, first of all, nobody is talking about entering into an agreement with the Spanish government. Nobody is talking about removing... No, but in a hypothetical situation, right. as you, you've just referred about, to no, the possibility of a wider agreement, well, talking, why would you believe them? No, but Stephen, hang on a minute. Nobody's talking about removing the blocks. Nobody's talking about an agreement. The distinction between myself and Mr. Picardo is that where is, whereas he makes these populist absolute statements, I prefer to actually always act in Gibraltar's best interest and what benefits this community. And therefore, and therefore, whilst I can't see a circumstance of where I would be removing, what I don't do is close doors because I don't think that, that is the right thing to do uh, in relation to Gibraltar. In relation to uh, this issue that you're asking me, I mean, you're absolutely right. There is a trust, a fundamental trust issue here, which has to be dealt with in any future agreement with, with Spain, which is that Although, we, although we've obtained benefits undoubtedly out of the Cordova agreements, because let's not forget, for example, that uh, we had recognition of the uh, uh, 00350 code. But it's true that they haven't complied with 100% of the Cordova agreements. And, one of the and each I time, say, they're, each and time one of they're reneging but, but more and finish, more on it. But let me finish. And one of the things that I always say in all my talks uh, in Spain is that there is a huge trust issue and that that has got to be dealt with. But Mr. Fitam, Mr. Fitam, if there is an issue of trust, you're not, you're not allowing me to answer it, uh, Stephen. I mean, I think that fairly I ought to be allow, allowed to answer it. What you're what you're really saying is, because they've reneged on Cordoba, we should not be talking to the Spaniards, and we should not be. No, no, them. no, no. no, 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 no it's my turn. Now it's my turn. What I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is that if they have reneged, if Spain has reneged on Cordoba. On what basis would you accept or would you uh, think that Spain would abide by any agreements, a wider agreement it enters, uh, which would involve, on our side, on Gibraltar's side, removing the concrete blocks? But look, if you're right, we might as well, we might as well switch the lights off on dialogue. If you're right, we might as well switch the lights off on dialogue. Because at the end of the day, dialogue 
is there in order to resolve problems. And what you're saying is that because Spain has reneged in the past, therefore she cannot be trusted and there's absolutely no point in talking to Spain. And you don't no, agree with I, that? No. I don't agree with that, but what I do agree is this, that in any talks and in any agreement, it's got to be very, very carefully structured to make sure that Spain does not renege in future. And any government of which I am head would make sure that if there are any talks and any agreements, that we close every single loophole. How do you do that, sure Mr. Fito? In practice, sure. in but practice, how can you do that? Because yes. that presumably is what your predecessor as a GSD leader, Mr. Caruana, Sir Peter, thought. He must have thought that the Cordoba agreements were binding on all sides, and yet it hasn't proved to be the case. Yes, look, legally, we can go into the technicalities of it. I mean, legally, uh, the Cordova agreements were what is termed in, uh, in public international law as soft law. They're actually agreements, but in actual fact, they're not binding as a matter of law. Now, so you think you they, could secure they, a binding agreement? Well, I, I am confident that if I went into talks with the view to reaching an agreement, that I would not come out of there with an agreement that I felt was not binding and that, that weren't the guarantees in place in the, the short term, binding. in the but short term, Mr. Vita. But, but, but the alternative, I mean, let's be clear about this. The alternative is not to have any dialogue because the argument is Spain will not abide by any agreement. Therefore, there is absolutely no point in talking to Spain. And, and that, I cannot accept that. That may be the reality. Well, that may be the reality of the situation that we have at present with, for example, the Pepe government. I mean, it may be. It may be. But I prefer to proceed on the basis of optimism, of saying, right, do they, are they in agreement with our conditions, which we believe are safe conditions for our attendance in talks? And if those conditions are met, to go to talks and then play it by ear. If at the end of the day, uh, we feel, or any Gibraltar government feels, that any agreement with, Sp with Spain is not... Uh, there is no use to coming to any agreement because they're not going to abide by it, then we can just simply walk out of the door. But obviously we've got to give a dialogue a chance. And I prefer to have some optimism, although I recognise this is a very difficult situation, than the situation that you hypothetically postulate, which is that we can't trust them and therefore there is no point sitting down with them because they will never uh, abide by any agreement. In, in the short term, with a general election due in the next year, or 18 months, or perhaps even less than that, um, from your own electoral prospects, isn't there a danger that in your efforts to appear reasonable and moderate on this issue and on other issues that you may be perceived as being soft on Spain? Look, I have dedicated 15 years of my life to politics. 15 years of my life, and I will dedicate, I hope, another 15 years. And my dedication is to ensure, one of them, is to ensure that we maintain a British Gibraltar and we defend the British way of life, and that we defend the red lines that have always existed, the important things to Gibraltar. What I am not going to do is dig myself into a hole by making statements that I do not believe come within those red lines and that I do not believe are essential to our defence of Gibraltar. That is what distinguishes me from the Chief Minister. You've said that hopefully you'll be in politics another 15 years. Does that mean that if you lose the next election, you'll stay on? Look, I've said that the issue of whether I stay on or not is going to be determined by the party at the appropriate juncture. You'd like to? Only, look, look, I think that, I think, talking uh, uh, honestly, as I always try when you ask, when you ask me this particular, but you, you ask me this particular question, I don't think that it is, uh, that you can achieve everything that you want to achieve uh, in politics as leader of a, particular, of a political party in two years. So that's at, a yes. At the end of the day, but at the end of the day, this is not for me to decide. It's for the party to decide. I'm a Democrat. I have put in place all the mechanisms for the party to elect a new leader, partly by the executive and partly by the membership, and they will decide. That's as far as you're going to get from me, Stephen.